Hello and welcome to Go With The Heat. I'm Dominic. And I'm John. I'm Melissa. And this is your cultural guide to the phenomenon that was Miami Vice. This week we're talking about Season 2, Episode 14, titled One Way Ticket. It originally premiered on January 24th, 1986. And it was written and directed by Cray Bulletin who this is the only episode he did any work on for Miami Vice, but he is the one-man brainchild behind this edition. So it's his fault. <laughs> <laughs> He's who we blame. <laughs> <laughs> well, before we get started, I'd like to check in and see what's going on in each other's lives. And first you will notice, Melissa is back. I'm alive. I live I lived to tell. <laughs> <laughs> it was close, so, though. It was a bad one. <laughs> such a and, go there for a while. Yeah, it was, actually. <laughs> if there were a person in this house who couldn't get sick, it's the one that does my laundry, cooks all the meals, takes care of the children, pays all the bills. Like, <laughs> there's, there's, the per- there's, there's people who are important around here and people who are leeches. I am one of the leeches. <laughs> <laughs> but, Melissa... You are a child of the 80s. You yes, love I am. all things 80s. You had your side ponytail, mm-hmm. your garbage pail kids lunchbox. Yep. My you little pony, your... actually. I had a My Little Pony lunchbox. <laughs> <laughs> your gem of the holograms. Yep. Which would bring up for a different conversation about what cartoons were even good in the 80s. <laughs> <laughs> but John, you will be interested in this information because Melissa, like a child of the eighties, is a huge WWE fan. Yes, I am. Huge. And, and tonight was WrestleMania. <laughs> it was huge in our house. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, I saw everyone tweeting about it. Based on the tweets I read, that it was mixed results. But the thing I wanted to talk about in this, which is going to hit close to home for Melissa, is that I believe, so you're going to hear this later in the week, and so there might be more news about it, but I believe The Undertaker, after losing his battle against Roman Reigns, folded up his jacket, his hat, and his gloves in the center of the ring, and walked out of the WWE ring for the last time. Yes, he. I think he's done, and it was very sad. I'm torn, because I love Roman Reigns, but... <laughs> wow. <laughs> but I'm torn. He hit me right in the heart. And also, I think maybe like, that did Demetrius might be in his room upset about it right now because <laughs> he loves Aww. Undertaker. <laughs> I love the Undertaker too, and I'm actually I'm a little surprised that, that that's the way they're gonna let him go out. Like I thought for sure there would be some big event with him in a coffin or something. It's well, I mean, you you remember all the all those spectacles they used to make when he had his uh, yep. manager way back in the day. You know, Paul, they used yeah, to wheel him had, out in the yeah. coffin and. Yeah, exactly. He had his, um, what was his name? Yeah, I can't remember his name, but yeah, with anyone that, my favorite was when they buried him alive. And then his hand, he punched through the dirt. Yeah. There was a big pile of dirt right next to the, which was weird, <laughs> right next to the ring. And like someone was wrestling and all of a sudden his hand just punched through the dirt. And it was like, oh my God, he's alive. I Thank love wrestling. God, we buried him in the ring. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right next to the ring. Convenient. No. Yeah, convenient. Right where uh-huh. the spotlight is. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, it's a big, night for WrestleMania. It's a big night for WWE. And this was a good episode of Miami Vice. So we have lots of 80 things to talk about. Let's go over and give our rundown of this episode. All right. So we come into a good Miami Vice opening. We're at a wedding. We're playing my favorite game, which is spot the 80s hairstyle. I'm for <laughs> sure I saw five flock of seagulls just hanging out in the in the crowd at this wedding. This and the clothes were great, too, episode, by the way. So Yeah, this episode is full of flock of seagulls haircuts. This is definitely <laughs> a who's who of hairstyles. <laughs> I will also say there were more shoulder pads at this wedding than a high school football team. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just wondering, who invites crocodile tubs to their wedding? Knowing their track record. Everywhere they go shenanigans happen hey, i was you know what? what i was thinking like is the is the bride like a former lover <laughs> yeah. or are they are they undercover is this barnett and rico talking about is tubs gonna fake a jamaican accent through the cake cutting <laughs> in between the shots of the wedding we also have mixed in a leprechaun doing cocaine <laughs> in the bathroom <laughs> that's one big leprechaun <laughs> who slowly morphs into is, is is he doing brown face i don't I'm, know I'm they said he sure was he's white brown but, face. but he looked awfully brown when he got out of that bathroom i don't know i don't know but i i did get the feeling from the assassin that he um 
He, he reminded me a lot of like, Andy Samberg, I guess. <laughs> yeah. That's true. I don't understand the disguise because the disguise made him stand out way more than what he looked like. So weird with the wig and those glasses and then being like potentially brown faced. <laughs> I, I don't know. I think maybe that draw, that was drawing more attention than him wearing that shiny green jacket he was wearing. <laughs> yeah, that, that green jacket made him blend in better with the exactly. wedding party. Yeah. <laughs> so we, we don't know his name right away. So watching him go through this transition, I'm just going to refer to him as Hugh Man. <laughs> <laughs> we ha we leave from the wedding and we go over to the reception and at the reception this is where the assassin is working the crowd as a member of the service party but we also have our first real guest star our first big time guest star i would say john we have jan hammer getting down with a band and so i mean i guess if you're gonna have a fake wedding jan <laughs> hammer is probably the most overqualified wedding singer you could get <laughs> so, and according to the notes, this isn't the only time he plays a wedding singer uh, in this show. So I think, you know, maybe it's more of a calling. <laughs> <laughs> Every time I see Jan Hammer, I'm like, that's Jan Hammer? Really? That's what he looks like? That's Jan? Okay. Okay. This, I, I'll take oh, your yeah. word for it. <laughs> it doesn't matter it how many times me I see of him. The... Of course, because Crockett and Tubbs are at this wedding, they know... Richard Langley, whose daughter is getting married, that is the assistant state attorney. I also know a man named Larry, who Crockett gives the ultimate cold shoulder to. Oh, I think the feeling was mutual on that one. They didn't like each other. <laughs> they did not like each other. And Larry, but like most vice weddings, you can just assume that it's going to end in a hail of gunfire. Bloodshed. <laughs> <laughs> well, you knew That's if they were there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's exactly what happens. Tubbs and Crockett go to say goodbye to Larry. He go Larry goes to take a picture, and Hugh Man comes running over and <laughs> opens fire and shoots three people. Tubbs and Crockett come running back in, chase him as Hugh Man runs out the back door into a boat and disappears into the night. And that's why you don't have your dock behind your house, okay? Because no one can ever catch you if you get in a boat. I have more questions about the docks in this episode, particularly. <laughs> so many about, docks. About docks at an, inter at an international airport and seaplanes. But anyways. I do want to point out that that was a smart idea to park the boat there. Yes. I'm surprised no one at the wedding even noticed, you know. Um, whose boat's this, you know? Why is it parked in a handicap dock? <laughs> Well, also, and this is to point out one more guest star, Larry is being played by, I didn't, sorry, you write down his name, so John, I'm sure you have some information on him, but I will only think of him as the dad from Home Alone. Yeah, he's the dad from Home uh, Alone. Yes, he is John Hurd, and I only think of him as the slimy FBI agent from The Sopranos. Yes, so, you are correct. Um, yep. The character he plays in this episode reminds me a lot of that character from The Sopranos. Just kind of slimy, mm -hmm. dirty, just kind of under the crime boss's thumb. Yeah, and let's face it, he's not like a great dad in Home Alone either. True. <laughs> well, after the boat gets away, we go to the opening credits. When we come back from the opening so, credits, we're back at the reception where the police are doing their investigation. So real quick, I do want to give John Hurd a little bit more acknowledgement. He was also in Battlestar Galactica, which I love. And he was also in Sharknado, which I love oh, for different reasons. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. He's the guy, like the, the guy that sits at the bar, huh? Right? Yeah. He's like the guy. So, he's like, yeah, gotcha. He's like his friend, but he just hangs out at the bar. And, you know, I, I, I don't want to leave those roles out because I do love him in those roles. The police are doing the interviews and Larry comes over to talk to Crockett. Crockett's filling out paperwork. And this is where we get more information about their past. There's like some exchange between the two of them, something about some guy named Gravy or Grainy. 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 Not Gravy. <laughs> Speak ill of the dead. I don't know, but Crockett. Grainy. <laughs> Crockett seems to always have a story for every, you know, and I'm always a little leery when Crockett's, when the episode starts and Crockett's got to explain the plot, you know, the backstory. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what happens is, is that Tubbs comes over and when you hear that Grainy was just some, some kid that was just getting started and we know that evan was his partner and now green and there's there's another guy that used to be his partner he just want to tell tubs like run dude 
Run, he's going to get you killed. He's not have a good track record with partners. <laughs> <laughs> and technically, with Evan, he lost two partners because remember he lost his oh, friend. Oh, yeah. He uh-huh. got killed, and then Evan got killed. So that's a double whammy on that one. So and then and so then you're Jimmy telling Smith. me that someday, someday Tubbs and Crockett might be at a wedding, and it might be uncomfortable. Um, yeah, maybe. No. <laughs> I mean, I don't want to give away too much, but there is an episode, the string of episodes where one of them have, has amnesia. So. Oh God. Oh. Okay. <laughs> Well, I, can't I was going to say, is Jan there. Hammer at this wedding? <laughs> <laughs> well, Just the, wink, if that's true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. Wink, wink. <laughs> Briefly, on the story of Grainy, that he's a new kid, Crockett showed him the ropes, they're going to go bust down some Rastas, and then Grainy gets shot <laughs> in the face. A couple times, twice. more than once. Yeah, twice. End, end of story. <laughs> well, maybe Crockett should be better at showing people the ropes. That's part of the problem right there. He showed them the ropes too well. <laughs> keep your face out of the ropes, kid. <laughs> <laughs> when they pull out the gun, Duck. hide Roll your number head. one. Duck. <laughs> Well, and that's where Larry comes in. Larry was the lawyer for the guy who shot Grainy in the face. He was able to get him off. Because basically, what I got out of this is that Crockett beat the guy up. Yeah, he tuned him up. He said, like, pretty good. And yeah. then he, yeah. And so, so in other words, he did, the, the lawyer did his job then, right? He got him off. <laughs> yeah. Like, he's yeah. a defense lawyer. See, what I get out, that's what I was going to say. What I get out of this is that he's a good lawyer. Not a bad person. He's <laughs> a good lawyer. <laughs> Going through this episode, I don't think Crockett gets the concept of what a lawyer does no i don't think he understands um, at all ever what a lawyer actually does i don't yeah. think he cares how do you <laughs> do that how do you do that with your conscience i'm a lawyer it's my job i, I I'm, I'm you know yeah, i do it when i drive right, my tell me they're guilty car. all the time i can't go i can't go that way <laughs> we head over to the precinct and Cat. It become, as soon as we come to the precinct, Castillo's like, "Yep, Richard's dead." <laughs> yeah, he's like, "Yeah, what we thought happened, he's dead." And also, the two girls that were with him, twin teenagers that were in the wedding, they're dead too. But we don't yeah. care about them. We only care about Langley. <laughs> yeah. a hell of a way to start your Monday, I'll tell you that. <laughs> the whole vice team is there. They all knew Richard. They're pretty broken up about it. We find out that. Richard Langley was leading an investigation with the DEA into John. And I, I'm so happy this happened. We've had Cubans. <laughs> we've had Puerto Ricans. <laughs> Finally. We've had, yes. we've had everyone. Now you have a criminal that is French Canadian. One of Let's your own. stop right now. The show does not need to continue on. We are hunting a criminal Canadian. <laughs> Okay. He took all Mounties that maple do syrup. this on horseback. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Are they smuggling maple syrup? Yes, he took all that maple syrup. He took it. He got all the really? tartar sauce. Really? And... dangerous Canadians? <laughs> he opened a chain. He opened a chain of restaurants where they serve mayonnaise as the dipping sauce. <laughs> yeah. Americans are out to find him. <laughs> they're, they're gonna lock you in the room and make you listen to Huey Lewis in the news. Oh God, no! Rush, Rush would be the worst. <laughs> and you can't leave until you write a ten-page paper on why the drummer is the best drummer um, ever played rock music. So, so of course, if you want to con- catch a Canadian, let's do what the Vice Squad does and let's go clubbing. <laughs> at a Canadian club. That's what it yeah. was. It was a French Canadian club. So, like, you're an idiot. If he would have just went to a different club, he would have never been caught. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Are there you're... really French Canadian clubs in Miami? Come on. <laughs> really? Fort Lauderdale. I would say if you're a French Canadian criminal, you should probably stay out of the only French Canadian <laughs> club in the entire country. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Then this is where I have two questions, too, because Castillo says he wants them to work this club that favors people are known to be at. One, is it this? This is the age old question for a Miami Vice. Why isn't homicide working this? Because case? homicide, they say earlier that homicide is working it. They're just not working it very well. They're okay. Not, they don't have any leads. And so he's like, we're going to help them out. That's basically what he says. And but they're not going to. They're not going to arrest anybody. They were just supposed to pass on the information that they found to mm. homicide. He so that's not that. how Vice so that- works. <laughs> no, Dominic, let me explain this to you. Let me explain this to you. All the drug dealers are on vacation. <laughs> yeah. They're all on vacation. This is one week a year. Vice has got nothing to do. And so they're, they're going to help a homicide case until everyone gets back into town with the drugs. 
and then they mm-hmm. go back to doing drug and hooker cases. Um, they took the hookers with them. <laughs> There's a convention somewhere. Well, this is my next question. Why are they going to go work a club in Fort Lauderdale? I thought they were Miami Vice. Why are they traveling to Fort Lauderdale to go work this case? Now, doesn't Fort Lauderdale, isn't there an FLV, a Fort Lauderdale Vice team? No. No. (laughs) Clearly there's not because nothing ever happens in Fort Lauderdale. It all happens in Miami. (laughs) Well, nothing can happen in Fort Lauderdale because apparently they have a high Canadian population. (laughs) People probably don't even jaywalk in Fort Lauderdale. <laughs> exactly. They're all being too busy being polite to each other. Okay, we can go on about Canadians all day. Let's get to the next scene where someone tries to murder someone with a fork. <laughs> he tries to take his eye out. That's what he tries to yeah. do. Yeah. Well, we head over to Le Loup, which is the name <laughs> of the club. <laughs> this, our man, our, our leprechaun man, he's walking around the club, and he just hears someone yell out from the side, It was you. So the leprechaun man stops, sits, talks for a few minutes, and then pulls a fork on him and holds it up to his eye. Fork you, man. (laughs) (laughs) So I want to point out another example of exactly how harmless this Canadian criminal is. This fight with the fork is broken up by a man wearing a bow tie. (laughs) (laughs) Well, yeah, the bartender comes running over to stop it, and the leprechaun man just runs when Zito tries to come over to, who's got an earbud in one ear. Like, that is not suspicious at all, right? That he's just sitting at this bar where criminals are known to hang out, and he's got an earbud in. Yeah, I mean, it's it's pre-cell phone, so it's not like he's, like, got a Bluetooth in his ear or something. Yeah. What is he doing? Listen to something like a Walkman in the the restaurant (laughs) or in the the bar? (laughs) He's not trying to blend in at all. If he was trying to blend in, he would have ordered some, like, poutine or something, you know? A little mayonnaise on the french fries. <laughs> well, when the leprechaun tries to run away, he gets away from Zito very easily, I might add, and then runs into Switek. And Switek, you know, they get him, and they and they arrest him for possession of cocaine, and there's like some words in French exchange. But I have a question about Switek. Is he... Is he dressed as undercover Canadian? Because he's wearing that goofy hat. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we head back over to the precinct and they're investigating. Oh, sorry, it's not an interrogation. It's our leprechaun man. He's talking to Larry, who the lawyer from the wedding. And Larry has some suspicions about the leprechaun man because he seems to know a lot about Langley's murder. And that's all that we see in this scene. There's just some suspicion. Yeah, some suspicion, and then he tells um, Larry to do his job. So that I, I think that's the whole point of this scene is to just show us that, okay, Larry's dirty. Which he right away then goes running over to go see Faber over at his place. And when we come into Faber's, he's like a horse breeder, does some, some horse racing, maybe. Faber is watching his daughter ride a horse named Popcorn. <laughs> you know that kid named that horse, right? Because the stupid name, Popcorn. <laughs> and that horse is like all embarrassed around all the other horses. <laughs> this damn kid named me Popcorn. <laughs> well, it's bad enough it's a Canadian horse. <laughs> yeah, you know, it has, a, has a, like, a little beret on. <laughs> to sum this up, Larry is very scared of Canadians, specifically this one Canadian jockey. <laughs> yeah, he's so um, tiny too. Yeah, I, 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 you said horse trainer or something. I'm pretty sure he's a jockey. Like, um, we have this really strange roundabout conversation, and basically the jockey tells him same thing the other guy did. Hey, do your job. Because Larry's saying, "I want out. I don't want to defend you people anymore. I've done this enough. I can't. I can't defend these your people anymore. I have. I suddenly have a conscience now." And Faber says, deal with it. It's your job. You're in too deep now. And by the way, you better get him off or I'm going to blame you for not trying hard enough. So when we leave from Faber's, we go back over to the precinct. And Crockett's is just doing some Crockett thinking time. He's just sitting alone <laughs> inside the, the music. The the <laughs> he, he sit, he's in, in such deep thought. And Tubbs comes up to him and essentially basically says, hey, we've got a meeting. Like, let's go do our job. And Crockett's yeah. like, I don't want to do my job. I don't <laughs> like do meetings. Yeah. Can you do it for me? Can you give the rundown? Can you tell him what I saw? I'm going to my therapist. Oh, my God. <laughs> and this is when we go to the airport and we see Larry again. He pulls up in his car. He get, he pulls up like a small like Cessna plane and he gets in it and he takes off. So he's a pilot. And we go into our first 
flying montage. We've had the driving best ever. <laughs> I was I was a little thrown off because the way the, the way the montage started at first I thought the yellow car was Crockett's car. Now I'm thinking, when did his Ferrari go from black to yellow? And it made me think of him because in later in his career he does a show called Nash Bridges in which and he has the yellow his car. Char- he has a yellow Barracuda that mm-hmm. he drives. Yeah, um, I love that show. And, <laughs> yeah, Nash Bridges is basically old Crockett. It's yeah. basically, San basically Francisco the character Crockett. he plays. It's San yes. Francisco Crockett. Well, what's great so, about this flying montage is that we're going back and forth between Larry flying and Crockett at the firing range. He's like rolling around. Why are you rolling around. He's- and why are the targets so racist? <laughs> He's kind of spry for a goofy white dude. I'll tell you that. Um, but I mean, don't you think did, all the other I, cops did, are like I, watching him, going like, "What the hell are you doing, rolling around? You're just to shoot your gun." That's at the what target. I was gonna say. <laughs> do you think they? Do you think the show showed him those scenes, like after they filmed them? Mm-hmm. Hey, this is this is you slowly rolling on the ground. <laughs> <laughs> Not fast. <laughs> well, and we yes. keep going. What I love about this is also that we keep going back to the air, to, to the flying, to Larry flying the plane, and it goes on forever. This yeah, is how like weird is the flying scene too. It's like not even look doesn't even look real. It looks like a fake plane, like it's like something like a model or something. I don't know. And by the end of the mo- montage, I-, I am like, if this plane does not crash into the firing range, like I, I-, I have no idea what this is even for at this point. And scene. <laughs> end of episode. Barbie Vice is over. <laughs> Crockett will never. Dodge. Yeah, Crockett's never going to roll again. There was a horrible accident. He can never roll again. He couldn't roll out out of the way fast enough. When the montage finally ends after 17 minutes airplane flying, we head over to a repair shop and we meet a fantastic new character in Tommy the Repair Woman who is hopefully going to fill in for our lack of are Izzy and Noogie people not showing up often enough? <laughs> they just didn't show up. They they had jobs to do. They just didn't even bother coming. <laughs> They're at the hooker drug dealer convention. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. They're the leader of it right now. Um, for the record, I so love I, her. She's like one of my favorite guest stars. I love her. I just like I just like her character. She's fun. Just a picture in your head. She looks and sounds a lot like Cindy Lauper. Yeah, she does. <laughs> She's totally so, 80s, right? Like, mm-hmm. think about her. We are peppered with the best guest stars in this episode as far as big name guest stars. But she is the, she, she does have, her name is Annie Golden, and she's an actress and a singer. She was actually in the early 80s in a band called The Shirts. They, re- they released three albums, like 80, 81. This isn't like Vice style. This isn't the only character she's played in Vice. She also played a hooker causing trouble in the NYPD police station in the episode, The Prodigal Son. Oh, yeah. I remember her. I remember her. Yeah. So, former prostitute, now Ferrari mechanic, <laughs> will upgraded. be featured in future episodes as well. Yeah, she got promoted. Uh, yeah, she, but comes she, was back also... a, she will come back as a mechanic, though. She continues her mechanic role. I will say that. Basically, what we learned from this scene is that Tommy is Crockett's go-to repair person. She's working on Larry's car at the time. She just finished work on the Ferrari. The bill's 600 bucks. Crockett's not very happy about it. But then before he has a chance to really argue about it, he gets a call on the car phone. Miraculously, when he happens to be standing right next to it, and it's a hidden voice, so, like someone who's covering up their voice. It says that the person who killed Langley is Felipe or Philippe Sago, who's the leprechaun who got arrested <laughs> the night before. <laughs> before we leave this scene, there's a few things. This is this is the scene I've been waiting for to talk about because there's some great stuff going on. First, I just talked about the fact that his mechanic is was formerly a hooker in a previous <laughs> episode. In the background. There is Ride Sally Ride, the song Mustang Sally playing. Very suggestive lyrics right there, you know, for a hooker turned mechanic. And we get an anonymous call to Crockett's cell phone to his car phone, which I guess it's a good thing that he's listed in the white pages. <laughs> yeah, because I mean, how else? Very would you select have... group of people that would have that phone number. 
Exactly. Exactly. I mean, not only, I mean, he's a vice cop. He's an undercover cop. I, I don't think very many people get number to his car phone. He's not handing it out. So, um, scare, uh, goofy voice guy, probably someone Crockett knows. Yes. And that's what Tubbs tries to bring up in the next scene when they head back over to the precincts and Crockett's pitching his anonymous phone call to Castillo. Castillo says they have nothing but the SIP, so they can't, they can't, it's not really any new information because they don't, they have no way to corroborate it. And Tubbs, as they are leaving, Tubbs says he's he's going to go call Zeno. And Tubbs says, hey, you forgot to point out something to Castillo, that there's a commonality here in Larry Thurman, Sago's lawyer, our buddy in the airplane, Crockett's nemesis lawyer, I guess. You totally missed out that there's a connection here. Uh, Castillo doesn't even know that. He's got enough on his mind. <laughs> you haven't noticed that we only see Cast- Castillo now in these short clips where he's just the decider? <laughs> he's just dad you go ask dad that. what he wants and then you make sure that you guys are on the same page so now what they do is, is they bring in the guy who got the fork in the eye <laughs> poor guy guy <laughs> <laughs> his name is marcel and he says he hasn't seen psycho in months Liar. Is playing bad cop he goes crazy he's throwing him against the wall tubbs comes in as oh. a good cop and marcel still says i don't have anything i want to talk to my lawyer is that what that's supposed to be? That's supposed to be good cop, bad cop? Because I have it as the old garlic breath technique. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I think that's just uh, that Crockett's out of control. Like, I don't think that was supposed to be good cop, bad cop. I think he just really lost control. And then um, all of a sudden, just about like, an hey, away from off. his face. And man, yeah. that's just got to be just terrible. Hey, I'm um, sure Crockett has beautiful breath. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you trying to tell me that man smells like garlic? I don't think so. He smells like roses no. or something. <laughs> but of course, the, the, this guy doesn't say anything because he's scared of the crazy Canadian. Who tried to fork um, him criminals. in the eye. <laughs> Tubbs drops some more truth bombs too. And when, when they leave the in- interrogation, he t- Tubbs tells Crockett. Crockett says, Sacco was our man. And Tubbs says, why is it homicide working in this case why are he's, why are we doing this he says he said well it's homicide's case we should tell them and he and then crockett's like well they don't have the what did he say they don't have like the manpower or i don't know something or they don't have a lead that we do and we do so we should go with it something like that it's like well if you just told them the lead then they would have it like, <laughs> essentially what he said was shut up rico i'm doing this so the only thing that they have here that they can go on is that Larry Thurman is their common person that's, sh- that's shared in all of these stories. So they're going to go talk to Larry. And it's not even them. Just Crockett is going to go talk to Larry by himself. Yeah, he goes mm-hmm. off on a, like a rant almost. Like, mm-hmm. no, I'm going to do it. I'll, I know what to do. And when he goes to see Larry, he, Larry's talking to one of his friends, Alicia. That's his ex-wife. Oh, okay. Yeah. Larry's talking to his ex-wife, and mm-hmm. he's doing going through a very a very intimate conversation where he's giving her back a few things. He's giving her back <laughs> that nude photo he yeah, had of her. Yeah, exactly. And then like, um, that statue that her... they fought over in their divorce, she said. Like, that was a Okay, I thought that was a hookah. So. <laughs> Whatever. Um, I don't know what it was, but... So, but then here comes Crockett, the master cock block. Um, <laughs> ruins himself, everything dude. for everybody else. Including himself. <laughs> yeah, and uh-huh. he asks him about Sacco. Larry says that that's his former client. He's not representing him anymore. And basically just Crockett comes in and lays the guilt trip on Larry. And Larry's like, I don't know what you want me to do. And Crockett just storms out. <laughs> He's yeah. just like, be a man. Larry's you like, should be a man. <laughs> and Larry's point is, is that I'm a lawyer and I am doing my job. <laughs> but we already established Crockett doesn't understand what lawyers do for a living. So. <laughs> so now we get to actually see some Canadian crimes. <laughs> <laughs> Did they have this guy in custody? Because if so, they have very nice showers. <laughs> no, they let him go because he didn't. He wouldn't give him anything. He like refused to work with them, so they're like, whatever. They just let him go. Maybe they should have kept him because yeah, you know, they, they might have been on to something. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, Marcel's in there taking a shower, and Psycho just comes in and shoots him. Scene. End of story. Yes. We don't know. Psycho never talked. He talked to Larry, and Larry had no information. Or sorry, he Larry said they have nothing on you, Psycho. Like the. There was no reason for Sago to go do this. No, but... Sago's an idiot. <laughs> That's what the problem is. <laughs> He's a jackass, and he does not understand. You don't, <laughs> you don't 
You don't mess with a guy from South Central Montreal. No, apparently not. Because <laughs> he carries a fork in his pocket <laughs> and a curly yes. wig. He can commit all kinds of crazy crimes. <laughs> no one will know who he is. Well, later over at the precinct, Trudy's giving the rundown to Castillo on Marcel's like itinerary of what he had been up to before he got shot and killed. And basically, Dad says, go make a case for this. And come back with more information. So then the vice team goes out and starts trying to. Apparently, they weren't actually trying before. So now they're actually going to try and go bring in more information about favors to go. Because Theo wasn't listening at all. He was just tuning her out. And then at the end, he was like, like, no, go make more case. So <laughs> Poor Trudy. She does all the work and gets no recognition. <laughs> like, seriously, she no. does all the work, all the labor. We work. hardly heard from her this season, too. Yeah, They let her speak true. earlier in the episode during the meeting. Remember, she was like, I was, he was so nice, he held the door for me. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> you had a mm-hmm. great personal connection with the dead guy. He held the door for you. He wasn't uh, a douchebag. He actually held the door. <laughs> did he even know your name? Did he just think you're just like a stenographer or something? Or, uh... Over at Faber's, Sacco is defending himself to Faber. He says that he thinks that Marcel was the one that dropped the dime on him. He had to be taken care of. So Sacco is working outside of his jurisdiction, I guess, in the game. Like, he's doing things he's not supposed to be doing. And Faber's like, eh, why don't you disappear for a while? After Sicko leaves, Faber says, I want you to take care of Larry. And, okay, so now Faber's put together that Larry is ratting out his own people? Because he, because Sicko said, he's like, oh, he told me it was okay and that everything was fine. And I think basically what, what he was, why he was having Larry killed is because Larry said he didn't want to do anything anymore. Mm. And then Sago said, I told him everything I did. He's like, I told mm-hmm. him all about it. And he said like, oh, don't worry. They don't have anything on you. So I think he was having him killed because he knew too much. It's like a loose end. You got tied up. <laughs> because it sounded like Sago's boss was telling him he needed to go lay low. I mean, yeah. Sago should have been going lay low, you know, wherever Canadians lay low. I mean, I guess that's what, Saskatchewan? Is that where they go to lay low? <laughs> Newfoundland, it's Newfoundland, actually. They go to the snow and they hang out. And <laughs> <laughs> so now we're going to get ready for another montage. One, we're going to have Sucko driving in his giant blue blockers. And, oh again, God, and again, the vice so team are the worst people at following people because Sucko immediately sees Slytek and Trudy in their convertible that are tailing him all over town. How many times have I said, why do they drive a convertible to follow people? <laughs> like, how is it this hard? And they don't look like a couple. So, no. like, who was going to buy that they were just driving around, like, having, a, like, a Saturday drive or something? Before he even starts flying the plane, in my head, I'm like, they're going to John Denver him. <laughs> and guy, like, going up the plane, I'm like, yeah, I don't trust that guy at all. He's got a hat on. So he's dead. Like he's, got, yeah. he's got like a, ba- a, back, a backward baseball cap on. I don't trust yeah. that mechanic guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I think like, oh, he's dead. They're going to sabotage the plane. He's going to crash. Montage continues on. We get a great one-liner from Zito asking Trudy if, if she thinks that he practices being a tube steak. <laughs> you mean Switek. Switek. Uh, Switek. Sorry, Switek. Yeah. Then we also get Larry in the plane, and he's replaying the conversation with Crockett in his head. And he's like, <laughs> sweating profusely like he looks like he's like i shouldn't have ate that chili dog before i started flying my plane that was a <laughs> terrible idea <laughs> yeah exactly and then randomly he decides at the end of that conversation like i've lost the will to live where's my airplane <laughs> and crashes yes. it into the and water you- and then because and you know what happens <laughs> because when plates hit water they, they, explode. they explode in big fiery explosions yeah, it's, an, it's, it's definitely a Miami Vice thing right it's, they have to carry it over they didn't have a car to crash into the water so they're like we got a plane who crashes into the water it has to explode into a fiery ball I would say <laughs> there the had EPA. to be someone at that production meeting that like was raising their hand like Technically, if they hit the water, they would just hit the water. It's like, shut up. We're doing an explosion anyway. No well, one asked you, Jimbo. We don't need your opinion. <laughs> I just want to say that maybe the EPA should look into the water off the Florida coastline. Maybe all these oil <laughs> drilling rigs are leaky. <laughs> it is it extremely was... <laughs> flammable. <laughs> Back at the precinct, after the plane crashed, they're having a meeting, and they say they only found bits and pieces of the airplane. No body was found. Larry's body was not to be found anywhere in the wreckage. And everyone is leaving for the night. And 
Sago was going to get on this airplane because we found out in the tail end scene, he tells Switek and Trudy, like, hey, I'm getting ready to leave the country for a while. Um, Convenient. Case, he tells them all that information. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I'm leaving at this airport yeah. at this time. I'm going to this country. You yeah, should exactly. come see me off. Well, I'm going to be skiing up at Whistler. So <laughs> when you guys, you know, <laughs> if you got some vacation time, it's lovely up there this time of year. <laughs> so it looks like Sucko is going to get away. But luckily, seconds before everyone leaves the office, Crockett gets a call on his phone, on his desk. And it's the caller is saying that he has all the information and put Sucko away. The gun is in a safe deposit box under the name of Collier. And the caterer's uniform was stolen the week before. The vice team also got a trace on the call to a hotel. So that's where they head to next. They go to follow up on the trace. And it's this hotel managed by the crazy cat lady from The Simpsons. Yes. <laughs> hey, she had two cats. Yes. Man. She's not crazy. She said two cats. <laughs> and they find, they hit the jackpot. They find multiple answering machines duct taped together. <laughs> 80s style. <laughs> hey, I want it noted that I'm Crockett just... and Tubbs were very nice to those cats, okay? That needs to be noted. They petted those cats. Crockett was holding a cat and Tubbs was petting it. They were nice to kitty cats. <laughs> so, so they have nothing. There, it was a recording, so they don't know who this is. Back at the precinct, the duo are waiting for Castillo to give approval and for Zito to get the warrant. They got to move fast because Sago is at the airport. He's getting ready to leave. Eventually, they get the call. But they have time because he's getting Sabaro. So <laughs> they've got like 45 minutes to get things rolling. He's Canadian. He's not getting the pizza. He's getting like those baked potatoes they used to have at the mall. And they, where they have like gravy on top of them or something. <laughs> He's the one that buys the Toblerone parts. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Castillo comes out and says they don't have enough information to move, but Larry calls. Sorry, Larry gets the call from Zito saying they have the warrant, so they all race off. Castillo makes sure to tell Crockett, do not make a move until Zito has the information on the gun. Yeah, because he's drilling out the, he's actually drilling out the uh, safe deposit box to get the gun. Yeah. So, like, they have to see the gun and make sure it's the right gun, like, ID it. So now we head over to the airport where they're going to go make a run at Sucko. <laughs> and I have so many fucking questions. <laughs> Can we at least address where Switek parks his car first? <laughs> How are you surveilling someone when you're the only car in the driveway of the airport, which is also at the dock? <laughs> I don't understand. But so I just want to make sure what I understand. What part of the airport is this? <laughs> what, what the hell is going on? I just want to make sure I understand correctly here. Right, we're at an, an airport, maybe. A seaplane. It's a, it's yeah, a, a seaport. <laughs> a seaplane comes and lands. It's a seaport, lands. and it's li literally like 50 by 50 um, so concrete small. pad <laughs> yeah. that's gated off, and then the plane just kind of drives up onto it where, like, there's a boat launch. <laughs> well, I was going to say, a seaplane comes and lands. So, one qu question one, you can take seaplanes for international travel? <laughs> That's the first question. <laughs> question two. Why did it not explode when it touched the water? <laughs> you, Dominic was shocked it had wheels. He was like, it's got wheels on the yeah, bottom. I'm like, well, how else would you get it from point A to point B but into the water? <laughs> it's made to land in the water. Why would it need wheels? If it has wheels, why doesn't it just land at the regular airport? Why does it have wheels? But how do you get it into the water from like the back of your truck? Because that's what you could put that plane on. It's so small. They have a boat launch. They could just launch it from the trailer. <laughs> they don't need a ramp if it has wheels, though. <laughs> it shouldn't need to leave the water. True. That is true. <laughs> but none of this matters because he doesn't take the plane, which makes no sense. I mean, if you're going to smuggle an Uzi past <laughs> airport security, why aren't you hijacking the plane? Um, I think airport security in that place was pretty lax because when all the crap goes down, they're also able to just drive on the runway. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, 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 this is like my favorite scene of the whole episode, okay? They get the call in that it's go time. Trudy and Switek are parked literally in the middle of the road, right in front of the gate in a convertible. <laughs> and you've already seen them. <laughs> yes. Then, when they get the call, they go <laughs> running. Sucko pulls out an Uzi out of his bag that he was going to bring on the airplane, <laughs> opens fire on Switek and Trudy, then runs for a... a civilian boat that happens to be at the dock of this 
quote unquote international airport where you can get so on the plane. I do want to, I want to point out too that the plane does not stop what it is doing. This <laughs> guy is on a deadline. He just keeps rolling. So like everyone just gets on the plane and they just bounce. They've got a schedule to keep. It even blocks. Tubbs and Crockett, because they drive onto the tarmac to go after Sako, and they get blocked by the airplane. Yeah, they're like, not on, not <laughs> yeah. on my watch, buddy. I got to get out of here, okay? <laughs> I have to get out on time. So then it turns into a water chase, where luckily, they can't just take the boat out into the ocean. The boat conveniently goes along a road that runs parallel to this water, with multiple bridges going over the top of well, it. Well, that's convenient, and because they don't have a boat. They just have their car, so they need to be able to yes, follow it. Yes. Once again, this is, so for some reason, I'm having this horrible deja vu from the first episode. But once again, we have Ferrari versus Speedboat. Yes. And my whole thought is, is that speedboat in water, in ocean, like <laughs> it should just be able to drive away. Like, <laughs> like why is he staying next to land? Where are these canals? Exactly. And then a police boat comes out of nowhere and just starts That's, falling. That Coast Guard boat's like, yeah, that Coast Guard boat's like hauling ass too. <laughs> and then at the end of the chase, it's just because they ran out of water. He ran out of water. <laughs> yeah. And then Crockett, I, I told you Crockett was going to jump on that boat. I'm like, yeah. I called it. He's from a bridge like, or somewhere. He's going to jump down from and, and just jump in it. <laughs> yeah, there's like 19 bridges. He didn't need to jump into it. The police had him cornered, <laughs> but he still jumps down into the boat anyway. And then says, quote, blink in your mind. Scene. <laughs> hey, he didn't. I think he should be commended because he did not murder him. <laughs> like he, like they usually do. That guy got out alive. Luckily, they <laughs> ran out of water. Because I don't know what Jasper Crockett was going to do. Was he going to like live free or die hard the Ferrari off of one of the bridges into yes. the boat? <laughs> <laughs> that would have been such a better scene. If, if that's what, like, they start following him with the Ferrari, then he just like turns the left and just goes out into the Atlantic. <laughs> and like Crockett just like stops like, oh. <laughs> Now, Zuggo is done. He's been caught. End of episode. They brought in their main man. They go back over to the mechanic just to follow up with Tommy to see because they know that she's yeah, got so Larry's car. So the show is over, but they still have about like three to five minutes to kill. Is what <laughs> yes. the feeling I got there wasn't here enough is. Episode. There wasn't written enough. They're like, we got to stall this sucker. So go over back over to Tommy. She'll do something fun. <laughs> like cook fish at her office or whatever. Yes. Yeah. And Tommy has a lot of information. She says that Larry paid up front for the repairs, said he'd be back in a few days, that Alicia would be the one to contact for any any help and probably to be there to pick up the car. And oh, by the way, after you left, a package showed up that I'm supposed to give you. Which, why doesn't she lead with that? Like, hey, guys, I got a package for you. That's kind of weird, right? I mean, but no, wait, I'm going to poach my fish. Hold on. <laughs> yeah. Larry said you'd be back and to give you this package when you came back. I don't know why I didn't tell you that the first time I talked to you when he, because he gave you all that information back then. Why didn't she say that then? <laughs> yeah. So also, also this, you know, she, the, they open up the package. They see, you know, they put the, they make the connection that it was Larry was the one was calling feeding them the, all the information feeding them the information the, the uh, anonymous tip and my thought is is it took you the whole episode when it took me about 30 seconds you know <laughs> also it's the most canadian thing okay they have this package that gives them everything they need to know to bring down favor so we go to the next scene the favor they show up and they take favor without incident <laughs> yeah, I know. He Favors didn't even yes. try to shoot him. Done in 20 seconds. <laughs> he didn't even try to ride yes. away on popcorn. I was disappointed. <laughs> popcorn didn't get to make another uh, appearance. <laughs> well, because he knows he's just going to be de deported. So, <laughs> yeah. you know, I mean, it's not that long of a flight back to Toronto. <laughs> so then on a hunch, because not on a hunch, really, but because they found the information out from Tommy, 
Crockett it's, goes to see no, Alicia. They were taking a romantic walk on the beach. <laughs> well, first they go see Alicia, and yeah. she says, oh. he gave me the statue and this picture of when he was the happiest out at Rum K. By the way, the islands over here is on this part of your Thomas Guide. Yep, make exactly. sure when you get to the end of this bridge, you make a left. <laughs> You've gone too far if you pass it. <laughs> see, I'm How surprised she showed them the nude photo. I, I thought say. she would kind of keep that in. Yeah. Why, why didn't they show the photo? That drove me crazy. What was in the picture? Was his penis in that picture? Was he naked in that picture? Because she said it's, this is it was a picture of him because it was where there he was the happiest. It's when he was the happiest. So you know what he's got. He's in his <laughs> birthday suit. Like... <laughs> He's got it in a hot dog bun. He's trying to be funny. <laughs> well, maybe I needed to see it, all right? Okay? I needed to, to see how happy he really was. I don't believe that he was happy on that island. <laughs> see him there? There, right next to him, he's got his hookah. <laughs> yeah. Then they go out to go see... They go out to Rum K to go see if they could find Larry. And so Tubbs and Crockett are taking a romantic walk on the beach, as you were saying, John. Holding hands... Talking, you know, whispering sweet nothings into each other's <laughs> ear. And then they bump into Larry, who's fishing. And they have a whole a whole good old time, you know. And Crockett being the softy he is, he's like, oh, we'll let you off with, you know, the whole fraud, being your death. And, well, Crockett's you know, being a real jerk, testifying too. part. Yeah, well, Crockett's being a real jerk boom still, too. And it's like, what more do you want, Sonny? Like, he brought down the, the entire Faber gang and solved this murder for you. Canadian will never be a criminal power again. <laughs> Thanks well, to not Larry. on this show. Not on this show, that's for sure. Not on any show. I was going to bring that up at, at the end, but out of any cop show you have ever seen, have you ever seen, has it ever been a Canadian criminal organization? I'm trying to think. I don't think so. I don't think I've ever seen... The only thing I've seen similar I've to that would be like like on that show Blue Bloods. Like they had one where it was like prostitutes and they were bringing them in and they were bringing them from Canada, maybe. Yeah, but they weren't specific Canadian criminals. Because I watch a heck of a lot of TV. <laughs> I can't bring up a French Canadian criminal organization. And I've even watched Canadian TV shows. <laughs> and I don't think I've ever seen a French Canadian criminal organization. <laughs> Well, Crockett just says, you want to be dead? Fine, you're dead. Bang. Bang. And freeze frame. <laughs> end of episode. They're going to let Larry off. Down, they brought the favorite gang. They just got a, basically, Tubbs and Crockett got a free trip out to Rum K. So, all is good. So, and that's the end of the episode. So, let's go over and talk about the music in this one. All right, John, it's another three-song episode, which seems to be a trend we're falling into. But we have some bigger names in this one. So I, I think I've figured out, I'm figuring out formula when it comes to these music choices. You have the big song at the time. You have the big name going solo. And then you have the iconic musician. So we will start off with the big thing at the time. We have the first song in the episode, Kyrie, by Mr. Mr., 80s American pop band. Who I've already talked this about in This Week in Vice. They had a number one song, and Kyrie will eventually be number one uh, in the next few weeks. Yeah, so basically, Richard Page and Stephen George, two members of the band, they were known as Pages. Yeah, great name. <laughs> they and, and they were doing like backup vocals for Laura Brandigan and the Village People, and they finally got around to putting together their own real band when they added members Pat M uh, Astolato and Steve Ferris, and that's what uh, that's that would make Mister Mister. And their first album, I Wear the Face, 1984, yeah, it didn't do so well. They actually weren't very popular coming out the gates. It wasn't until their, uh, uh, so as they started recording their second album, Richard Page was actually offered the lead vocals job for both the bands Toto and Chicago as the bands were trying to replace Bobby Kimball and Peter Cetera. But he actually turned them down and, and stayed with Mr. Mr. And they released their second album in 1985, Welcome to the Real World which would actually be their only commercial success. But that would be right around the time Vice is filming this episode. They would get their biggest hits in the songs Broken Wings, Kyrie, and Is It Love. 
they'd appear on MTV Spring Break Tour, and then they would tour with, like, Don Henley and Tina Turner. So they were riding high when they were filming this episode. Like, it was such a good thing that Richard Page turned down Chicago and Toto because Mr. Mm-hmm. Mister is going places, right? Yeah, they blow up. Oh, yeah. So their third album comes out, just suck. <laughs> Before they could even knock out a fourth album, the label drops them, then members of the band start leaving. And so they'd eventually just break up before the fourth album would even be released. Mr. Mr. died and never came back. <laughs> Probably should have took that job at Chicago. Um, I think that one would have been the one. So, but hindsight. <laughs> Our next song of the episode is Face the Face by Pete Townsend. Which is weird because Mr. Mr.'s first album was I Wear the Face. And now we've got a song called Face the Face. And this is during Pete Townsend's solo career. So... Pete Townsend, the lead singer of The Who. Uh, I believe we've already talked a little bit about, didn't we have a Who song or a Pete Townsend song earlier? I, th- I We have, and I think we've had some other members of The Who who end up going on to do their other own solo stuff, too. Like, I believe we've had a Roger Daltrey song in there, too. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm going to stick primarily to Pete Townsend's solo career with this. His first solo album came entitled Who First came out in 1972, but no one really gave a crap until he came out with <laughs> his breakthrough solo album in 1980 called Empty Glass, which is what featured Let My Love Open the Door. Uh, it couldn't uh, happen to a nicer person either. <laughs> and, and, and apparently that song is used at the end, like when they run the credits of a, uh, of movies. So, oh, you know. so, so Pete Townsend did like one of those rap songs that sums up the entire movie <laughs> that you just watched. 90s rap, yeah. <laughs> so, no, it's a song that covers the credits. And so in my mind, that's like that song they play at the, at last call at a bar to get everyone to leave. <laughs> you know, in 82, he would release All the Best Cowboys Have Chinese Eyes, which makes <laughs> Absolutely no fucking sense. Wow. 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 Yes. Uh... <laughs> yes. Holy and that crap. was his and that was his first solo album post the Who. How so... dare they how dare Pete Townsend solely this Canadian episode that we have. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. So he would also release White City, a novel, and The Iron Man, a musical and psycho derelict, which would take him into the 90s. Pete Townsend, his hearing was permanently damaged in 1968. And from what I've read, it's attributed to a combination of really loud music and one specific event that happened while they were performing on the Smother Brothers Comedy Hour. In 1968, when drummer Keith Moon packed his drum set in explosives. Great idea. <laughs> and the resulting blast basically damaged his hearing because he was standing directly in front of it. Well, that's what The Who was known for back in the late 60s. Like, you know, the Ed Sullivan show performance where they have where they smash their guitars and stuff where it was like, you know, you have the Beatles who are like, you know, buttoned down. Everyone loves them. They're, they're, you know, they're not quite to the era of this psychedelic music. So you have everyone who's supposed to put on this great facade of being wholesome. And The Who was like the exact opposite of that. That was their whole yeah, stage you know, persona. And- and Pete Townsend, you know, for the most part, from the 60s on, he had, especially with The Who, he he had he, he had an arrest for assaulting a police officer. He had numerous arrests for destroying property. You know, he really lived that up while he was with The Who. Last thing you might not know about Pete Townsend is he plays a guitar. Uh, <laughs> uh, keyboards. <laughs> the banjo. <laughs> the accordion. The harmonica. A uke- the ukulele, the mandolin, said- the violin, the synthesizer, the bass, and the drum. I just imagined him, Pete, Pete Townsend, picturing Pete Townsend in my head being Dick Van Dyke from Mary Poppins <laughs> <laughs> with all those instruments. <laughs> I totally feel you, but what scares me about that image of him being Dick Van Dyke from, from Mary Poppins is that he's it's a sex child offender. Part? Yeah. <laughs> yes. I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> Yes. So let's get on to our last song, to the accomplished artist. (laughs) Um, (laughs) So let's talk about Mustang Sally by Wilson Pickett, a.k.a. the Wicked Pickett. (laughs) Yeah. 
<laughs> so he's an American R and B soul singer, and they, and actually he's a major figure in the um, development of American soul. He recorded over fifty songs that made the R and B U S charts, and a, a number of those same ones that landed on the top one hundred. He's most known for songs in the Midnight Hour, Mustang Sally. And Funky Broadway. Let's see, he was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 1991. He started touring but, uh, in gospel groups around churches. Wilson Pickett. He's he was born in 1941. His whole career goes spans from the late 50s on. And a lot of times with these artists, their like their story sounds a lot similar in that he was a singer. He, he wrote a bunch of songs. And, like, his breakout, he sent a demo to Jerry Wexler, a producer at Atlantic Records. Mm -hmm. And Wexler liked the demo so much that he gave it to their best-selling artist at the time, Solomon Burke, who then performed it and made a bunch of money off of it. Pickett, finding out that they weren't actually going to sign him and that they just gave the song to their other artist. Pickett was crushed. <laughs> until he thought he was going to be, like, sent him this song, was going to make it, and they just kind of passed the song along. But it did inspire Wexler to eventually buy Pickett's contract from the record company Double L. All throughout, from 1965 through pretty much into the 70s, Pickett would just jam, man. He was always in studio, produced, that's when he would produce the song. In the Midnight Hour, which would be his uh, first big success, selling over a million gold records. Also featuring Isaac Hayes on the keyboards. Then he'd also... Technically, Mustang Sally is a cover of a Mac Rice song. But Mac Rice is a former band member of his. Uh, they were both in the band The Falcons back when, when Wilson Pickett was still trying to break out, you know, around the time he sent the uh, demo tape in. Pretty much, yeah, he would do all kinds of... Uh, he'd pretty much be in the studio, and he's responsible for a lot of songs. Uh, like 68-69 studio session in which he would cover Hey Jude from the Beatles. But he would also release the song Hey Joe, which would eventually be made famous by Jimmy yeah. Hendrix. Kind of fizzled out around 74, but he continued to uh, record until 99, just not seeing as much mainstream success. And he'd actually continued to perform until 2004, until he got sick. So Wilson Pickett might, was also known for appearing in the 98 film Blues Brothers 2000 in which he performed the song 6345789. And he was actually mentioned in the original Blues Brothers, which featured several of his bandmates at the time. So he just wasn't specifically in the original, which is why I think they included him in the remake. But let's talk about uh, Wilson Pickett's arrest record as well, because <laughs> uh, like Pete Townsend, he got in trouble a little bit. Unlike Pete Townsend, it's not that creepy. <laughs> but it is interesting. In 1991, man, the early 90s did not go well for Wilson Pickett. In 1991, he was arrested for yelling death threats while driving his car on the front lawn of Mayor of Inglewood, New Jersey, <laughs> Don Aronson's lawn. <laughs> In 1992, he would be arrested for domestic violence for a fight he had with his girlfriend. In 1993, he would hit a pedestrian with his car, Pepe Ruiz, who was 86. Ruiz would later die that year. Wilson Pickett would plead out on a DUI case and spend a year in prison. Damn. Apparently, after that year in prison, he'd get his, stu he'd get his act together. Like I said, he recorded until 99, but nothing mainstream. Um, and then he died in 2006 of a heart attack. So there's your music. I think you summed it up good with his, you know, we have a the, the new hotness, someone launching their solo career, and then a deep cut, someone that we don't recognize now, but was really important back in their time. So it's, you know, like you're right, I think they're falling into a formula. Let's go over and talk about our final thoughts on this episode. All right, Melissa, 
I know that you're a fan of this episode, even before we watched it. This is one that, that you like from season two. So what are your final thoughts on this episode? I do like this episode, for the record. <laughs> yeah, I like it. One of my favorites of season two. Of season two. I like that it's a complete episode, for sure, that from start to finish. And it's a different story. It's not a crooked cop story, which I know mm-hmm. is a favorite of yours. <laughs> and there's no old like love interest for Crockett, which can kind of drag it down sometimes. Or no sweaty tub scenes so i'm good with that i like it and i think that it makes sense and it is nice not to have every single villain be somebody who's hispanic <laughs> give True. the give the people a break okay i mean i know they live in miami but can't everybody cannot be like colombian or cuban or dominican or jamaican although i do miss tub's accent when he doesn't get to do it but so yeah at least the villain was something different and uh you know being french canadian <laughs> I'm going to sum up all of my final thoughts in a single scene. I want somebody, please explain to me, why do seaplanes have wheels? <laughs> why do they come ashore like that? <laughs> I always wondered how you boarded a seaplane. I thought I was a duck, but apparently they come on land. Also, what is with this international airport? Can you just ride your boat up to the <laughs> seaplane at this international airport? What the <laughs> fuck is going on in Miami? Someone please tell me. Go with the heat at gmail.com. Email me. How the fuck do <laughs> seaplanes work? Was there an international airport in Miami where you could get on a plane in the water? Email me. Tell me how this whole thing works. <laughs> John, what are your final thoughts on this episode? I did like the episode. I, I got to give it to him. I, I enjoyed the episode. Two things. One, the Canadians in this episode weren't Canadian enough. <laughs> um, I am highly offended as someone who has Canadian heritage in, uh, in, amongst my bloodlines. I wanted to see more Canadianist. Canadianism. I don't know. Uh, something, however you say it. <laughs> I don't know. Someone playing hockey. I want to see some <laughs> curling. Um, I, I need to see a mullet or a Labatt Blue. A uh, Molson, you know? I just, I don't know. I don't know. I, there, there are lots of non-minority mafias out there. There is the Irish mob. There is the Russian mob. Or Chechnyans, they're, I mean, they just, anything Eastern Europe, I guess, has a mafia. I have never heard of the Canadian mob. I mean, I, maybe there is one, but I, I assume, I, it would be the equivalent of the Amish mafia. I'm not very scared of them. Uh, the way they're gonna come at me with brooms. <laughs> All you do is turn on the light and the Amish just scatter. Just run away. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> <laughs> Damn you! Bring people keep trying to follow me with with these. Uh, the, I have horses and carriages trying to follow me around, but they just can't keep up with my Saturn. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> keep leaving them in the dust. Oh, um, <laughs> so uh, I I like the episode. I just I don't know. I I I, I just disappointed. I, I wanted more Canadianism. Or, <laughs> Canadianism. <laughs> Or a real criminal. Well, I, I, I did like it. Well, it was a good one. It's a good one to follow up on last week, which is our okayest episode of season two. So this is a strong <laughs> follow up. We hope you enjoyed this episode. Email us. We would love to hear from you. Please tell me how the fuck do sea planes work and why was this one coming on land? <laughs> Can you drive your car on a tarmac? I don't know. Email us, go with the heat at gmail.com. Check out the website, go with the heat.com. Find all the ways to subscribe, including YouTube, iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher. We would love to hear from you. We'd love to see your reviews of the show. Go ahead and leave a review for the show on your podcast platform of choice. Helps you, helps more people find the show. That's going to do it for us this week, and we'll see y'all next time. Bye, pal.